has given me a word uh, for all of us uh, that is going to direct us, is going to calibrate us, is going to take us into a new direction in the direction that he desires for us. I want to start by saying I want to acknowledge our bishop, Arthur Jamie Croon, in his absence. I want to acknowledge our co-pastor, Tanya L. Croon, in their absence. And uh, we just want to keep them lifted in prayer. Uh, we're so thankful for them and for this opportunity to be able to uh, stand in this place and stand in his stead. And so I don't take that lightly. Uh, Pastor Tanya had, uh, Prophetess Tanya had started a series or started a, a message last week and wasn't able to finish it. So I'm sure she's going to finish it when she gets back, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but in the interim, I have a word from the Lord. And so I want to uh, just acknowledge my wife, my lovely wife. She's my bride of 17 years. And when people ask me how long we've been married, I tell them 34. I have 17, and she has 17. And so I'm so thankful for her because she is such an encouragement and such a gift to me. And she's one of the ways I know that God really loves me by who she is and what she means to my life. And so I want to acknowledge her. I also want to acknowledge uh, the, the, the people that are here behind the scenes. And I see what you all are not privy to see today. I see people that are doing God's work in excellence. And they do it every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday behind the scenes. And we don't get to see it. But today I want them to know that they're actually preaching my message. And so I'm thankful for them for being in place and how they serve the Lord to such an excellent, excellent uh, level of service. And so I'm thankful for you, and I'm continuing to pray that God will uh, bless you to the point that it blows your mind. And people have to ask you what is going on in your life that things have changed and things that are so well with you. So I'm expecting that for God, uh, from God for you all this week and, and on because you all are serving him in such an example that many of us don't get to see uh, week after week. So I just want to thank you for, you know, for being here. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to get to the word. And I was told that I had about an hour and a half. Is that correct? Oh, okay. Okay. I see the clock. I can't see that from back here. So it looks like an hour and a half. So if I need to cut it down, I'll, I'll try to cut it down. <laughs> but we're going to get right to, uh, right to the word here after we pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for this day. I thank you, Lord God, for uh, what you've placed inside of me for your people, Father God. Uh, right now, I, I pray, Lord God, that I would decrease. I pray, Father God, that when they hear me, they would hear you, Father God. I pray that when you people see me, they will see you, Father God. I pray that the word that you've hidden in me would take root right now and blossom supernaturally and quickly, Lord God. That the fruit that comes from my lips, Lord God, will bring instant change, Father God, and will nourish and guide and direct your people. I thank you for this word, Father God, for being first partaker, and I thank you, Lord God, uh, that I know that your word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish everything you send it out to accomplish. So use your word to give us strategy and direction today, and we will give you the glory and honor in Jesus' name. My message today is going to be taken from the scripture in Ezra. It's going to be Ezra, first chapter, first through the six verses. And then we're going to jump down to the third chapter, verses 10 through 13. That's Ezra, first chapter, first through six verses, and then the third chapter, verses 10 through 13. I'm going to be reading in the New American Standard Bible version, and I ask that you would read along with me. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to rebuild him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Whoever, I'm sorry, which is in Judah, Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, 
and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And every survivor, in whatever place you may live, the people of that place are to support him with silver and gold, with equipment and cattle, and with a voluntary offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the father's households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests of the, of the Levites rose up and everyone whose spirit God stirred and everyone whose spirit God stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with equipment, with cattle, with valuables, aside from everything that was given as a voluntary offering. Now we're going to jump down to verses 10 and 13 of chapter 3. Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple, the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang, praising, giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his favor is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout of joy when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' households the old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the house that was laid before their eyes, while many others shouted aloud with joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of weeping of the people, because the people were shouting with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. I want to minister today from the subject, making the shift from former to latter. Making the shift from former to latter. I wonder how many of us are tired of hearing about COVID. Every time we turn on the TV or we turn on the radio, it's some news about COVID and what COVID is doing and how it's affecting us in many areas of our lives. But unfortunately, COVID and this pandemic is part of our new life, our new lifestyles now, nowadays. When we think about COVID, we have to think about the impact that it's made on, on everyone. In, in our own households, in our neighbors' households, people on our jobs, people uh, at, uh, at the gyms, people at the grocery stores, everybody we've come in contact with has had some kind of influence by this pandemic. We know that the obvious uh, result of the pandemic is the great loss of life. We all know that. But the pandemic has also uh, created other situations and other uh, things that have made it difficult for our lives. It's said that 40% of households are facing serious financial problems. They've exhausted savings and they have difficulty paying bills and problem securing medical care. It says the crisis is widening uh, the inadequacies between the classes in America that already existed. It says 36% of the households with children are having a challenge keeping their children's education going. And among working households, 18% report serious problems getting childhood, uh, child care when adults need to work. For households with children, 34% either do not have a high-speed internet connection so that their kids can attend school or have the connection so that they can work from their homes. 41.3% uh, of the businesses that are uh, out here are suffering. They notice that 41.3% of the businesses have closed their doors, and some of them closed the doors permanently. Staffing in these businesses has caused uh, an issue as well with quality and with customer uh, service because the workforces that are there are now dropped to 39% on an average. 
hospitals are having difficulty uh, because their, their, their units and their uh, rooms are being filled with COVID patients. And so other people that need treatment that would ordinarily be able to get treatment are having problems being able to even make an appointment for doctor care. COVID has effect, affected so many different industries. It's affected our transportation and it's caused uh, challenges for our products that we need on a regular basis. Think about uh, when we had the shortage on paper towels and toilet paper. Those prices are now skyrocketed because it's hard getting product from one place to another. I remember seeing a funny play or a funny skit. It was about uh, a man sitting at his desk paying his bills. But instead of writing a check, he was putting pieces of toilet paper into the envelopes and sending it off. It was because toilet paper had become so valuable. And that's because of the difficulty in transportation. It's affecting restaurants. I saw a restaurant down the street from me. It used to be called Wingstop, but now it's called Thigh Stop. The wings are so expensive now, they can't afford them, and so they had to come up with another option. And so they started buying thighs and selling thighs as opposed to wings. There's so many issues that we're experiencing, even in retail. Since people are working from the home, they're buying online, and so our, our brick and mortar stores are suffering to make ends meet. The, the impact of COVID has also affected the church. When we look at the church, we see, according to Wired.com, reports that COVID has upended churches in the U.S. and like so many other areas, the pandemic, pandemic is causing an impact that's not felt equally. Churches that are large churches that have already had technology are able to continue with the shift to Zoom and some of the other social platforms in order to uh, continue doing services. But churches in rural areas that never had an internet connection are now suffering and trying to uh, meet the needs of their people. Giving on an average has dropped according to, uh, according to some of the surveys from 25 up to 32% below uh, what was normally normal giving before the pandemic. Some churches have experienced the even greater up to 50% of a reduction in their giving. Attendance in our services, even online, has dropped, and it's not even compared to what it was in person uh, prior to the pandemic. The Gallup poll says that churches are, uh, the people that say they're a member of a church has dropped to 47%, and it dropped from 70%, uh, which was the number back in 2000. Church doors are permanently closing at an unprecedented rate. The pandemic has destroyed what we once knew as the church and how we did church. And so now we find that we're asking questions as leaders. What's going to happen to the church? How do we move forward from this new norm that we find ourselves in? Haggai 2 and 9 says, The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. But how do we draw a line from where we are there in this scripture to where we are now? And I believe in my study that God has already provided some clues when we look at the tabernacle and how it was rebuilt in Ezra. And so I want to start with the history of the tabernacle so we can have some background to understand why there was a tabernacle in the first place, how it came about, and then what happened at the, de at the destruction and the rebuilding of the tabernacle. You see, at one time, the tabernacle was, was just a, uh, the temple, I'm sorry, but the tabernacle was just a, a mobile worshiping area. And so what we had was we had a tent that was erected and we had a wall that was erected. And the people would come and they would worship God and they would, they would give their sacrifices. And then when the, when the time came, they would pack up the tent, pack up the wall, and they would move to the next place. And then they would, they would erect the tent, and then they would erect the wall, and it was there uh, that God's spirit resided, and they would come and they would worship him, and they would leave their offerings. One day, David, 
King David, sitting in his palace, realized that his palace was majestic. He looked at the wood and the materials that went into building his palace. He looked at all of the silver and gold. And then he looked at the, at the tabernacle and he said, why should I have a house built out of such grandeur and not have the same for my Lord and my Savior, my God? And so he called Nathan the prophet and he said, Nathan, I want to build a temple for God. God was okay with being in the tabernacle. But when, when, when uh, David went to him in prayer, God consented and he said, okay, I'll let you build me a temple. And so David, though he had the desire to build the temple, was not allowed to build the temple for God. You see, God didn't want a man of war building his house of peace. And so he disqualified David to build, even though David was said to be a man over after his own heart, even though he was the one that fought with David. He said, I need a man of peace to build my temple. And so Solomon, David's son, King Solomon was the one that built the temple for God. Solomon builds this temple back, uh, builds this temple. And Solomon, remember, was Solomon was a man of great wealth. And so everything, he, everything that he did was in great uh, grandeur, and, and, and uh, it was to the, the furthest extent. And so he built this temple for God. It was 180 feet long, 90 feet wide, and 50 feet high. He had all of the best materials placed inside of this, this temple. He had uh, the best materials used to build the temple. In today's time, if we were to build the temple as Solomon built it, we would have to pay half a billion dollars to erect that temple. It took seven years for Solomon to build the temple of God. And it was known as Solomon's temple, the first temple. Some years later, the Babylonians came into rule and the Assyrians came into rule. The Assyrians conquered Israel, and the Babylonians conquered Judah. This was between 721 B.C. and 606 B.C. Both Assyrian and Babylon kings would conquer a territory, and then they would take the people and they would pull them out of the territory and take them back to Babylon and Assyria and try to assimilate them. Imagine being pulled out of the U.S. and shipped over to a foreign country having to learn their language and having to learn their customs, having to eat the food that they eat and worship the gods that they worship. Imagine that. And that's what happened to the people, to the Jews. And so they were in power. They were trying to assimilate the Jewish, uh, Jewish nation. And also in this time is when Babel, the Babylonians uh, destroyed the temple that Solomon had built. They, took, they looted the temple, they took all of the value, uh, valuables out of the temple, and they brought the temple down and they destroyed it. And so the temple stayed in that uh, destructive state for a number of years. And that's where we find the story picking up in Ezra. You see, Ezra was the, uh, tells the story of the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of the wall. Nehemiah tells the story of the rebuilding of the wall. Some people uh, it, it thought that Ezra and Nehemiah were actually one book. And actually in the Hebrew Bible, you will see that Ezra and Nehemiah is known as one book and it just has a hyphen between the names. And so Ezra and Nehemiah cover uh, the building or the rebuilding of the temple and the walls. Also, the writer of Ezra and Nehemiah is also assumed to be the writer of First and Second Chronicles. The, the book of Second Chronicles ends, the last two verses ends as the first two uh, verses start in Ezra. And so the writer of the, of the four books are, are, uh, are thought to be Ezra. Now, in that time, Ezra and Nehemiah, there was also a book called Esther, which uh, Esther was the Persian queen. And so it's thought that her book kind of covers the, the time between Ezra and Nehemiah. These three books are the last 
of the 12 history books in the, in the Old Testament. And so these three books lead us up to uh, the point of the Persian rule, which is 536 B.C., when a king called King Cyrus now conquers Babylon and as prophesied by Isaiah over 150 years before his birth, takes the, the job of rebuilding the temple. At that time of the prophecy, the temple had not fallen yet. And so that's interesting to know that God still does speak from eternity to the situations in our lives. If God said it, he's going to perform it. Regardless of what the situation looks like in our lives, he's already made provision for it, and he's going to perform it. And so what bring, that brings us to the point of Ezra uh, in the scripture that we read. So I'm going to have four points that I'm going to make, and I'm going to uh, sit down and take my seat after I make these four points. I'm not going to be long today. But I believe that if we consider these four points, when we start to think about where does the church go from here, I believe these four points will give us the tools and the strategy to get where, where God wants to take us. God wants to take us from the former things to the latter things. And we know with God, the latter things are always greater than the former things. And so I want to pull four, four verses out or four points out, and then we're going to talk about those four points, and then we'll go from there. The first point I have is if we're going to move from the former thing to the latter thing, we've got to consider our hearts. God's not considered with the numbers. God's not considered with uh, how things look or how things appear. He's looking at the heart of people. When we look at verse 5 in the first, uh, first chapter of Ezra, it says, then the hearts of the father's households of Judah and Benjamin and the priest and the Levites rose up, everyone whose spirit had been stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. My question for you is, when was the last time your heart was stirred? When was the last time God got your attention to the point that you couldn't shake it, that he gave you an assignment and you couldn't put it down until you were able to complete it? When was the last time he moved you to that point to build for him? One thing the pandemic has shown us is that the commitment of some people has been exposed. If we have to ask you over and over again to put it on your calendar, if we have to ask you over and over again to be engaged, to volunteer, to work, to, to do what it is that God's called you to do, then this may not be the work for you. You see, God in this scripture was specific about who he desired to do the work. He desired the ones whose hearts were stirred, the ones who would go and work without being told this needs to happen. David didn't need to be told to build a temple for the Lord. David loved the Lord so much and he understood what the Lord had done for him so much that he wanted and he desired to do that for the Lord because he felt it was right. When you can work because you desire to do for the Lord uh, because of who he is and what he's done in your life, then you have been stirred by God. When I walked in here today and I saw the excellence that was done uh, in setting up and preparing for the, you know, for the service today, I saw it done in excellence. People coming in early and, and preparing and being ready to, to do what it is that God desires them to do so that they can reach people in the kingdom. That's the kind of stirring that I'm talking about. When God doesn't have to ask you over and over again and the pastor doesn't have to prod you and your, your fellow a brother or sister doesn't have to say, well, can you please do this for me? We need to check our heart condition today and know what's in our heart. Have we considered our heart? If we want to move, from swift, or move swiftly from former to latter, the second thing we need to do is we need to let go of what was and focus on where God has taken us. 
Chapter 3, verse 12 says, The old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes. I had to do some research because I didn't understand why, while some were worshiping and praising God and singing praises and playing instruments, there was a sect, there was a group that was worshiping, and it says that they were weeping so loud that you could hardly distinguish their weeping from the praises. So why were these men weeping? They wept because they remembered the foundation of Solomon's temple. They remembered how grand Solomon's temple was and how how they used to go to Solomon's temple or hear about uh, people going to Solomon's temple to worship. But now the footprint of this new temple is much smaller. The materials that went in aren't as as, uh, elaborate as the materials as before. The amount of gold and the amount of silver going into building this second temple isn't going to be as it was with the first temple. And so they remembered the first temple and it caused them to weep. The problem is the people that gave didn't have the resources that King Solomon had but they didn't need the resources that King Solomon had. God wasn't calling them to rebuild the temple as it was. God was calling them to rebuild the temple. And the temple in that day was different from the temple in the previous day. We get in trouble when we think about how church was and we want to make it the way it was. But in this new season of our church, we can't make it the way it was. Because the things that we did in that time aren't going to meet the needs of the people today. And so we have to be careful looking back. You can't drive a car looking in a rearview mirror. You've got to look where you're going, and you've got to make sure that you're where God is. And so we want to avoid looking back to what we used to do. We want to seek God and ask, God, where are you today? What is it that you would desire from us today? We spend so much time lamenting over what was that we run the myth, the risk of missing God. If we want to move from the former to the latter, then we've got to let the old things go. Third point, don't wait to praise him. Praise God at every opportunity. In chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, it says, Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple, the Lord, the priests uh, of the Lord, the priests stood with their apparel and their trumpets, and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the direction of King David of Israel. And they sang praises and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his favor is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout of joy when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house was laid. Now, wait a minute. They praised God because the foundation of the house was laid. There was no temple erected. It was just the foundation of the house. As a builder myself, I understand that When you go to look at a house and a house is complete, people look at the the landscaping and they look at the the house itself and the the windows and the doors and uh, what kind of material is on the side of the house, whether it's brick or siding or stone. They look at the shingles, they look around the back at the patio and they look at all these different things in the house and then they go in and they look at the kitchen and they look at the bathrooms, they look at the bedrooms, they look at all these different rooms of the house. But I've never seen anybody focus on the foundation. No one looks at a house and say, man, this is a beautiful foundation. I've yet to see that. I've never said that. But they looked at the foundation and they began to worship God. I believe they understood that the foundation was an indication that the temple was coming, that the promise was coming. And whenever we know that the promise is coming, we don't have to wait to praise God. We can praise God right then and there. When the foundation is laid, and then and only then can you know what the potential of the house is. 
You say you can build the biggest house, the nicest house, but on the poor foundation, that house will fall. The foundation has to be sure and it has to be set and it has to be able to handle the height and the width of the house that you're building. And so when we look at the foundation, we understand that the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, for man has not revealed that to you, but only my father in heaven. And on that rock, on that foundation, I will build my church. That is the foundation that we're looking for today to build in this new era of the church. It doesn't matter that the house or the full picture hasn't been seen yet. All we need to know is that the foundation was already built before time. And so we can look to that foundation and begin to praise God because we know that we're praising him for a finished work. If we're going to move from former to latter, then we've got to understand that we need to take every opportunity to praise him. Now, when I looked at the praises that they were giving, they said, for he is good. And responsively, responsively, uh, or respondently, another group said, for his favor is upon Israel forever. And so I understand praise. Praise is, is acknowledging God and thanking God for what he has done in your life. That's what praise is. But there is a thing called worship. When you move from praise to worshiping God, you're saying, I know who you are. In spite of what you have done or what you haven't done, or if you even do anything else, you are still God. And so when I looked at what they did, they praised him by saying he is good. But then they responded by his favor is upon Israel forever. Forever had never gotten there. So when they praised him and praised him uh, for what he had done, they shifted gears and began to worship him for who he is and what he's able to do in a time that they had yet to reach. And so praise does a wonderful thing. It ushers you into the presence of God. But then it, shifted, it shifts you from praise to worship and understanding who God is in your life. And that brings a deeper relationship between you and God. And so if we're going to move from former to latter, we got to understand that we need to take every opportunity to praise God. Finally, if we're going to move from former to latter, then we need everyone, everyone to understand that they have something to contribute. In verse, verse one, uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And all of those around them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with equipment, with cattle, and with valuables, aside from everything that was given as a voluntary offering. There may not be equal giving, but there can be equal sacrifice. We've got to understand that we all have something that we can contribute to the church of the new century. We got to understand that resources aren't always money. Resources can be your talents, it can be your skill sets. Resources can be an encouraging call. When you pick up the phone and you call somebody just to encourage them. Resources can be your time, it can be your help, your assistance. Resources can be a quiet prayer. Just lifting up somebody's name in prayer. There's all kinds of resources that we can contribute for the building of the church, transitioning us to the former to latter. And, if, and we, it's important to understand that not everyone was called to build, but everyone was called to do something. And so when we make the shift, or as we make the shift from former to latter, we must understand to do that, we must consider our own hearts. We must turn our attention from what was to where God is now. We must praise God at every, every opportunity. And we must realize that we all have something, something that we can contribute. 